This program is brought to you by Agnes Scott College. For more information about Agnes Scott College, please visit our website at agnesscott.edu. Good evening. On behalf of everyone at Agnes Scott College, I'm delighted to welcome you to our campus. We're so pleased to be able to host tonight's event in partnership with the Georgia Center for the Book and in celebration of the center's 10th anniversary. I want to extend a special welcome to those who are on our campus for the first time. We are a liberal arts college for women, enrolling students from 44 states and 27 countries, and dedicated to the mission of educating women to think deeply, live honorably, and engage the intellectual and social challenges of their times. You'll find a brochure at your seat, and I invite you to share it with bright young women in your family and circle of friends. Agnes Scott alumni include many notable firsts, women who broke through barriers of prejudice, stereotype, and convention to do what no woman had done before. So it's especially fitting that tonight's very special guest is not only a women's college graduate, a graduate of Sarah Lawrence, but the greatest woman pioneer in the history of broadcast journalism. Barbara Walters' extraordinary career has spanned decades and encompassed an incredible number of firsts. The first woman to co-host a morning news program and indeed to make the leap from today girl to a full-scale, highly respected television journalist. The first woman to co-host the network news and a legendary reporter and interviewer with a staggering number of firsts to her name, from the first joint interview with Egyptian President Anwar Sadat and Israel's Prime Minister Menachem Begin, to the first interview with President and Mrs. Bush following September 11th, to the first interview with Monica Lewinsky. She has received many honors and recognitions for her work, including induction into the Academy of, T of Television Arts and Sciences Hall of Fame, and even a wax portrait at Madame Tussauds in New York City. What makes Barbara Walters unique is that so many of our best and deepest insights into the history makers, cultural icons, and celebrities of the last 30 years are in the public domain because of her trademark interviews. Now in her memoir, Audition, she takes us vividly behind the scenes of her personal and professional life, sharing its ups and downs with gut-wrenching honesty and humor. And what shines through on every page is an infectious curiosity about an affection for humanity. For at heart, I believe that is what Barbara Walters is, a great student of humanity. It is fitting, given Ms. Walters' iconic status as a pioneering female anchor and interviewer, that she will be interviewed tonight by a woman television anchor who followed in her footsteps. Jovita Moore anchors the five o'clock newscast on Channel 2 Action News. She joined WSB-TV in 1998, following stints in Memphis and Fayetteville, Arkansas. A native New Yorker, she is a graduate of Bennington College and the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. And like Ms. Walters, she is the recipient of an Emmy Award. She made the 2007 list of 40 under 40 in Georgia Trend Magazine, and is an active civic leader and volunteer. Please join me in welcoming Jovita Moore and Barbara Walters. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. How oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> you have fans in Atlanta. Oh, lovely. And I'm oh, sure lovely. when they're not watching The View, they're watching 2020. All on Channel 2, right? <laughs> well, you don't have to watch anything. What's today? Monday. You don't have to watch a thing until Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> but I do want to say thank you because this is such a beautiful, uh, beautiful city. And, and to know that all of you have come here at night when you could be home, you know, putting your feet up and everything. Um, I'm very appreciative. And to have Jovita here as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
So we're going to talk about 20 minutes, and then we'll have the audience uh, opportunities for questions um, with Ms. Walters for about 20 minutes as well. Um, Can I say something about the questions? Sure. Okay. When you read the book, if you read the book, it is a very personal story. It's also, in a sense, history, because as you read about what I'm doing, we try to talk about also what's happening in the country. Um, and it has various aspects to it. But it starts with my uh, grandparents. And my favorite story that begins the book is about my paternal grandmother, who on her deathbed said that she was a virgin. <laughs> and her grandchildren said, well, Grandma, you've got seven children, so that means that you did it <laughs> at least seven times with Grandpa. And she said, I know, but I didn't participate. <laughs> so the reason that I'm telling you this, which you probably will never air now, right? <laughs> is that I expect you all to participate, OK? Because that will be my reward and my pleasure to be able to answer your questions. All right. Wonderful. Okay? Wonderful. <laughs> We've, we've only spoke briefly um, backstage. Let me tell you a few things we have in common. You heard the president mention that um, I went to Bennington College, and you went to Sarah Lawrence, which were sort of like the non-Ivy sisters yes. um, uh, until Bennington went co-ed. Uh, but so I applied did Sarah to, Lawrence. It, it, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I applied to Sarah Lawrence, though, but did not go. So, and, and chose Bennington. Um, also, the TV news thing, obviously, we have that in common. We're also both Libras. Your birthday's in September, yep. mine is in October. Mm -hmm. We're both Libras. Um, your mom was from Lithuania. My father is from Lithuania. So there's another, another uh, you know, thing in common there. And you mentioned a best friend, Shelby. My daughter is named Shelby. Ah. So isn't that something? Yes, it is. Lots okay. of things. So that's my icebreaker. But one of the things that you and I talked about, which is a sort of a, a theme that runs through the book, is trying to, and you and I were speaking of this, it is very difficult for women today, and it certainly was when I was working and there was even less, um, perhaps, help for the working woman, to have that balance between marriage and children and a career and the guilt that you feel, um, whatever choice you make. And in, in my case, it, it, uh, because I was working very long hours and because I had a child and and um, it didn't work with the, with the marriages. I struggled throughout the book to try to find examples. For example, Catherine Hepburn um, decided, uh, we can all do imitations of Catherine Hepburn. I don't want to have children. Out of my way, Johnny. Out of my way, Katie. You know? <laughs> um, so she didn't have children. Audrey Hepburn, on the other hand, gave up her career for children. So when I thought of, of my life and of raising my daughter, and there's a very strong chapter about my daughter and the difficulties we went through in her adolescence, because I think so many parents are going through it. One of the things that you will find is this need to balance and how you do it. And let me just tell you something which I think will be very reassuring. You will always feel guilty. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think I just got it. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> That's it. That's it. It goes with the territory. Did you ever find a way to juggle? Did you feel like well, you I ever did. managed I, the juggling? I did. I mean, it's much easier now in many ways because employers, one hopes, are a little more understanding. On 2020, we have uh, many women who share, do, do job sharing. Uh, on The View, um, Elizabeth Hasselbeck comes in and nurses her baby. Uh, 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 Sherry brings her child. And we're much more open and easy about it. Uh, so I think maybe television is, is, is perhaps more understanding than some other businesses. But you work longer hours. You travel a great deal. And I joke when I say you'll always feel guilty. But I, I hope that a lot of the things that happened with me, my failure when I was the first female co-anchor of a network news program, I was, I was a, a flop. My career was over. A lot of people today are losing jobs. A lot of people go through failure. And I hope that my own example maybe is of some help uh, in writing about my early years, in writing about my sister. I almost call this book Sister, who was considered mentally retarded. Today, she'd be called intellectually impaired. And my feelings about her, my love for her, and my 
resentment of her. I start the book that way because I want people to know that my life has not been perfect. Few people's lives have been perfect. And although I'm blessed with having an absolutely wonderful life and have met, interviewed every president since Richard Nixon, every murderer, um, <laughs> most heads of state, there were certain struggles, and that's what this book is about. My second question, for, for Aaron's purposes, okay. are you okay with that? I am okay with okay. that. Okay, my second question would be, so why did you write the book? Why now? I wrote the book now because I'm in a very good place. I could not have done it a few years ago. And also, I had left 2020 four years ago, and I thought, oh, now I can learn Spanish. Now I can travel to a city for more than one day. Mm -hmm. And then I signed a new contract to do four specials a year. Huh. <laughs> but I was already into the book. And I thought, if I'm going to tell the story, I'm going to tell the whole story. Therefore, this book. Okay. All right. I'll give Erin a, a chance to wrap up there what she's doing. And this will be on the news tonight at 11. Does that give you what you need? <laughs> yes. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. And it's nice to see a female ca camera person. Yes, yes. She <laughs> And we have, we have several at our station, actually, so, and they're, they're all great, great photographers. And you, you, the title of the book, Audition, yep. do you feel still auditioning no, always? No, I'll, 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 well, let me start at the end. Um, I was at a dinner the other night in Los Angeles when the head of a motion picture studio said, how do you know when it's time to stop auditioning? Because I've been auditioning my whole life as a child, because of my sister, I felt people made fun of her. They made fun of me. She was three and a half years older than I. And I felt I had to audition to make friends. Um, my father was in show business, produced and owned, at one point, the greatest nightclubs in America. Uh, but we traveled a lot, and I had to audition for new schools. And at one point, my father, where we had always lived in penthouses, lost everything. And then I was supporting my mother, my father, my sister, my daughter, and I was auditioning constantly in my career. And in television, you do. Um, a year ago, I lost a very good friend named Beverly Sills, mm -hmm. who was one of the great sopranos uh, of our time. And when she left the Metropolitan Opera, her husband gave her a ring with an inscription. And then 10 years later, she left as the head of the New York City Opera to go to the Metropolitan Opera. And she gave me that ring. And the ring says, I did that already. When you feel, I did that already, then if you're lucky enough to feel that way, you can stop auditioning. Mm -hmm. And I do feel that way now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When do you think there, was there a moment when you knew that you were a pioneer, where you felt? No, you know, one of the reasons that I wrote this book, so many young people, young journalists, especially female, uh, come up to me and say, I want to be you. I want your life. What a great life. And I have said to them, then you have to have the whole package. I think the feeling is that I've just gone up, 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 up. And if I paved the way, um, and if I made it easier for there to be a female behind the camera or in front of the camera, it wasn't because I was waving a flag. It was because by my own ups and downs and by my own struggles, certain things happened. And when I see all the women now, that's an enormous reward for me. For example, it wasn't until I was on the Today Show for nine years that I was made co-host. Mm -hmm. Now, every morning program, uh, all the Good Morning America and, and, and the Today Show and the CBS Morning News. The woman is a co-host. Mm -hmm. Almost every local anchor uh, is either a woman or is, is, a, is a team. It took me nine years, and it took, um, at one point, a man who was the host of the program who would not let me come in and ask a question until he'd asked three. He didn't want any. That was the compromise. He didn't want me to come in with any question. So perhaps by standing up at that point, and perhaps by doing some of the other things that I did, 
it, it made it a little easier. But I was not Gloria Steinem. I wasn't out there championing women's rights in television. It doesn't happen that way. It happens by your work. It happens by not whining. It happens by trying to find a way if you fail. It's that way with everything you do. It, it doesn't happen because you stand up there and shout. Sometimes it does, but I mean, I'm not against marches to make things happen. But in your day-to-day -day life, that's not how it happens. So talk about that sexism that you faced at work day-to-day -day with these men who wanted you to be just the today girl and do the girly interviews and don't sit on the set with me and do all this other stuff, but not do the harder, serious stuff. What was that like getting well, through Well, when I began in the Today Show, I began as a writer. Mm -hmm. And I was hired to do only, there was only one female uh, out of eight writers. And the writers also produced. Um, and you never got that job until she died or got married, or preferably both. If she got married and then died, then you know you had to um, So I was hired to write a feature, a, a, to write the fashion shows and the celebrity interviews. And my big breakthrough came when a man on the program, whom I'd worked with as a writer at CBS, said she can write for the men. I can write for the men? And then Hugh Downs came in as the host, and I loved Hugh. And the woman, there had been 15 Today girls before me. And the last one had been Marina Sullivan, the mother of Mia Farrow. She was a big star, and she just couldn't hack it for various reasons. And so it was in the middle of a convention that nominated Lyndon Johnson. They took her off, but they were waiting. They had to pay her. So they were waiting to find another star. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, they put me on for the base salary, which thrilled me. I was making $750 a week. <laughs> and they put me on for 13 weeks, and I stayed on for 13 years. Mm -hmm. When Hugh left, a man named Frank McGee came in, and this is the man I told you about. He didn't want a partner. He didn't want me. He didn't think that females should be asking these questions. And that's when he had that ruling. And the way I circumvented it was that I went out and got my own interviews. I did the first interview with Henry Kissinger. I did the first interview with Dean Rusk. I did the first interview, I think, with, with uh, Jimmy Carter. And so I was either applauded or I was considered the pushy cookie. But that's when, at the Today Show, I became Barbara Walters. And when Frank died, contractually, they were forced to make me co-host. The big jump came when I decided to go to, from NBC to ABC mm -hmm. as the first female co-anchor of a network news program where I had a partner who didn't want me, and I was a terrible failure. So, I mean, those were the two. There was a long time when I couldn't even talk about those years without crying because I was finished. And, and I, I just, I didn't know where I was going to go. And then, as you will see, I did perhaps the most important interviews of my life. Little by little, worked my way back until I ended up once more on 2020 with Hugh Downs, mm -hmm. and was there for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And did those interviews outside the studio, because you had to get them That was the only way that I, could, that I could do interviews that were not just the girly interviews. Mm -hmm. I don't mind doing the girly interviews. I mean, I love doing the fashion shows, and I love doing the celebrities. But I also you know, wanted to do the presidents, and I wanted to do the heads of state. And people were much more interested in that uh, than they are today. Today, it's all celebrities getting out of rehab, but there was a time when there were, <laughs> there were other interests. You, um, you use the word failure just now, and it comes up a lot in the book, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you were doing such great work. What do you think, where did that tenacity come from? And, oh, and, and why do you still see it as a failure when you were still succeeding in so many ways? Well, I, when I came to be the, the co-anchor in the news, I was a failure. I mean, you won't read about it. I mean, it, I was a flop. It was a headline in every paper. What saved me were the specials, because part of that contract that nobody paid attention to mm -hmm. was that I had to do four specials a year. And that was the beginning of what originally were political and celebrity specials. The first one had Barbara Streisand and her boyfriend, John Peters, and President-elect and Mrs. Jimmy Carter. And the specials that went on became more and more popular although we, we knew from the ratings that people were less interested in the political part of it. Second special had the Shah and Empress of Iran, and to me, a memorable interview when he said she wasn't, a woman could not rule. Little by little, the audience 
told us they wanted more celebrity specialists. But um, it did save my life. But in the beginning, for a good two years, I didn't know whether I would work. I didn't know whether the station would let me go. I was supporting my whole family. I used to get letters, though, and, and that thrilled me from women, not women in this business, who said, hang in there if you can make it. We can make it. And one day, when things were very bad, I got a telegram. And I opened it up, and it was from someone I didn't know. And it said, don't let the bastards get you down. And it was signed, John Wayne. <laughs> what has been the response you've received so far? You're traveling all across the country, talking about audition. What a, what's the response you're getting from, from uh, people who have read it and then viewers, say, from your show? Well, shows? I think when the book came out, uh, the, uh, the book was embargoed, so nobody even knew what was in it and, uh, until um, last Tuesday. It's only been out two weeks. And I understand that it's number one in the country, so that's very gratifying. Mm -hmm. um, and I think because it is a story that people can relate to, to, to be able to meet people, and I can see a lot of your faces, but to have people come up and share their stories with me, some who have family members like my sister, uh, some who went through what I went through with my daughter, and that was the hardest chapter to write because we had a terrible struggle when she was an adolescent. And I go through it in some detail. And I had said to Jackie, um, I just realized that today is my sister's, would have been my sister's birthday, May 19th. My daughter Jackie is named after my sister because I wanted my sister to feel that she also had a baby. So my daughter said to me, I get, this was the only chapter I gave my daughter Jackie. I said, what, what do you want me to do? If you don't want me to tell all this, I won't. And she said, put it in, Mom, because they should know that if, if we can make it, that other, other families can make it. And today, my daughter runs, owns and runs a therapeutic wilderness program for adolescent girls in crisis. It's in Maine. It's very hands-on. It's called New Horizons. So everything she put me through <laughs> is, <laughs> as she now works at. My daughter is also adopted. This is no secret. And she, um, she writes about her feelings about that and her feelings about having a celebrity for a mother, which although I thought my life was very normal, it was difficult for her. I will tell you one story about the adoption. At a certain point, I, Jackie had never wanted to find her biological mother, and I thought she was trying to protect me. So I said to her one day, listen, darling, if you want, I'll help you find your biological mother. It, it's OK. I know what we have together. And, you know, we're fine, and if you'd like, I will do that. And she looked at me and she said, I've had so much trouble with you, why would I want another <laughs> one? <laughs> you, so the book is very personal. Very personal. We Sometimes I think too personal, but there it is. To, and there it is. So let's, let's go ahead and talk about one thing that people have been asking about, I'm sure, ever since the details started coming out. Um, a week ago, the the admission of an affair with a married man. Yeah, I'm the first woman who's ever had an affair with a married <laughs> man in history of television. Um, as a matter of fact, nobody has asked me about that uh, in, I think, just after the first few days, no one. So, because I've talked about it so much that even I'm bored with it. I did Oprah's <laughs> program, and um, that was the first day and the book came out. And um, Oprah, her people, uh, 10 days before, released just that one little snippet. And so that's what got all of the attention. When people read the book, that's four pages. The book is 612. And I had put it in because I'd also written not only about this man, but about Alan Greenspan and about Senator John Warner and people who had some meaning in my life. And I did that not because the man was married. We broke it up because the man was married. Uh, we knew that that was the wrong thing but because he was African-American. And 31 years ago, had it been revealed, it would have destroyed his career and mine. We are 31 years later, and we have an African-American running for president. And so I didn't put it in because I wanted to give a juicy tidbit. I wrote it because I thought it had some historical meaning. Um, 
the senator knew that I was putting it in. I wrote to him. Um, and uh, But because it was the only thing that came out of the book, it had nothing about my sister, it had nothing about my parents, it had nothing about my career, it had nothing about presidents, it had nothing about celebrities, it had, there was one, as you'll see when you read the book, it's four pages out of 612. Uh, uh, the first week I was asked about it all the time, and I think now people um, understand that it was not, that this is not a kiss and tell book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are you surprised that people would focus on those four pages? No, I, I explained mean? why. You see, it was the only thing that they knew mm -hmm. for 10 days. The book was embargoed. Nobody had it. Mm -hmm. Nobody, journalists like yourself, got it in advance so they could prepare questions. Mm -hmm. But nobody else had it. So for 10 days, that was the only thing you knew about the book. Mm -hmm. You do talk about the other special men in your life. That was part of this. Mm -hmm. And other relationships that you've well, had. Well, I talk about my marriages. I don't. Mm -hmm. give, give me the book. I want to show you something. <laughs> I've, I've read. That's okay. Now give it to me. Thank you. So the other day I was on Ellen, and she was, we decided that it was, you know, I talked about it enough, and, you know. So I opened the book. I'll give this back to you. Okay. Inside, if you look in the front of the book, you see all these names? Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names. And the same thing in the back. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names of, of every person from every walk of life. These thousands of names are people I interviewed. But I showed this to Ellen, and I said, you may think that these are people I've interviewed. Actually, these are people I've slept with. <laughs> <laughs> so we will go on to other things. <laughs> and Ellen's name was one of them, by the way. <laughs> And that's why I didn't want your cameras running, OK? <laughs> um, do you? <laughs> and none of you are going to say anything about this, right? <laughs> Were you worried at all about um, backlash from the book, that you would be so candid about your life across the board, talking about the feelings about your sister, um, your father's business dealings? And then no, there's been no so backlash. I think I think what I mean, I was either going to write a book I did not want to do, and then I wrote, and then I interviewed, and then I interviewed. No, I, I really, I, I mean, the, I think the reason people have bought this book is because they do understand that I was being candid, and they can relate to it. There's no reason for it to be backlash. It's, mm -hmm. it's my story. I'm not mean to anybody. There's no revenge in this book. There's no, it, it's saying, this is my life. Some of you have had lives that are very similar. In many ways, our lives are similar. So there's no, you have backlash if it's a revenge book and you're writing about, you know, bad things about this one and bad things. That's, that's not what this book is about. So there's been no, I mean, it's just been, for me, the most wonderful experience to mm -hmm. travel around and, 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 uh, uh, and to meet people who, who really, are, you know, you have a minute with them and, and they will say how the book affected them or if they haven't read it how what I was able to do helped them, especially a younger journalist. So, I mean, it's been the most satisfactory experience I could have. You talk about the Monica Lewinsky interview being your best get, your biggest get. Yes, it was the most watched news special of all time. But what I do here, I don't write about, um, there's very little of the interview. What I wrote about primarily was how the interview came about. Mm -hmm because I thought that that was in interesting, um, how one, I get, because everybody wanted this interview. And the fact that Monica did not take money for this interview, and that was an enormous thing because she was very much in debt. I feel today, and I'm in touch with Monica, that she's the only one who's still suffering. Everybody else has moved on. And um, she just got a master's degree from the London School of Economics. She's trying to restore her life and have meaningful work, and she still has this shadow of ridicule over her. Um, but it was, I remember when we did the interview, it was two hours long, and a lot of people said, well, I'm not going to watch that. <laughs> and I was in my apartment with just the people that, that I had worked with on it, um, and I looked up, went to the window and looked out in the street, and there wasn't a car moving. 
<laughs> and it was and still remains the most watched um, news interview. Mm -hmm. It was at that time a big get. I, I left 2020 in part because I was, I really didn't want to go after the gets anymore and, and the kind of thing that you have to go into today to get the get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone still out there that you'd like oh, to interview? Oh, yeah. I mean, there are people you, well, I, I mean, the, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis never did an interview. We would all have liked to do that. I think she was probably wise not to because she had she could keep that aura. Uh, the Pope, this one and the last one, the Pope, they have not done interviews. That would be a, a very, uh, that would be a great honor to conduct an interview. Mm -hmm. uh, the Queen of England doesn't do an interview. And I had said uh, recently, somebody asked me this, a reporter for the New York Times, and I said, no, I'm not going after the big yets. And he said, well, what if Osama bin Laden called? <laughs> and I said, I'll pack tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> How do you get, give me some tips. How do you get those interviews? Like, what do you do to make those people sit down and talk with you? Well, it's not anything I do. I think, first of all, you have to think, why would they want to do it? So instead of telling them why you want to do it, you have to think of why would they want to do it. A political interview is very different from a celebrity interview. Politicians have something to sell. You have something to give them, and you can be much stronger, much tougher. Um, there was a while when you didn't ask any personal questions of politicians. Now, uh, you know, 50% of what you're doing, it seems, is asking them personal questions. Celebrity interviews are different, and then you want them to feel that they've, you want the audience to feel that you now know them in a way you did not. I very often start asking about their childhood mm -hmm. because you talk to someone about what do you remember most about your childhood. This is very often when people, tears will come to their eyes when you think of specific things that happened in your childhood. I may ask them what their very first job is. I promise you that every single one of you may not remember what you did yesterday, but you can remember your very first job, right? Yeah. Okay. So that the, if you can, I do a lot of homework and I write a lot of questions and I listen because it's not the first question or the second question, it's what do you mean by that? And what did you think about it? Mm -hmm. And not every celebrity wants to do an interview. It has to be something that they want to talk about. And for me, it has to be more than just plugging a movie. Do you think you'll ever patch things up with Star Jones? I have no problem with Star Jones at all. I, I've, I, all I said about Star, uh, I wrote an, uh, a chapter in The View and explained why the network felt forced. I did not, I wanted Star to stay. The, I, I do not hire or fire. And it was the network that decided that Star had done certain things in her own life that made the audience feel they didn't know her anymore. And um, I was very sad to see Star go. I think Star is going, this is all I've said about Star, is that she's going through a difficult time. Uh, her show went off the air, her husband and, and she are getting divorced. Her husband, I understand now, is uh, wants to go on television and, and explain, Al Reynolds wants to talk on television. I have no problem with Star. I remember the wonderful things that she did and was the first nine years that she was on television. So. I called Star last year. We had breakfast together. I missed her, and, and I wanted her to know that I supported her, and that's the way I feel today. Did hiring Rosie help or hurt The View? It helped. Rosie, the ratings were huge. Rosie, I love Rosie. I mean, I know Rosie very well. Rosie left The View herself. I didn't, we didn't want her to leave The View. She had a one-year contract, and, and the network and she could not come to terms. It was a roller coaster ride. Uh, some ways were wonderful, some ways were difficult. Rosie had said she hadn't worked in three years and she'd had a very successful show before that. And she said that she didn't want to drive the bus, she wanted to be a passenger. And then when she started the show, she said, no, I want to drive the bus. <laughs> so that was sometimes difficult, but Rosie is an enormous talent and, and uh, she'll be fine. And, and she just did a, uh, a limited run on a, on a musical in New York. And Rosie has very, very, Rosie has emotional issues which she addressed on camera and off camera. And sometimes they were difficult to, uh, for her and, and for the people working with her. But Rosie is a, 
is a huge talent with a, with a very big heart. Mm -hmm. One of your questions, surefire ways to start a conversation, is if you weren't on fill in the, or in doing fill in the blank on TV, what would you be doing instead? Well, probably writing for television. And I, the, the book was not, I mean, I, I wrote the book the way I talk. It is not that beautifully written, but I, I wrote the book the way I talk on television. Yes. And writing for television is very different than, than writing for a newspaper mm -hmm. or writing in general. So I probably would have continued, um, you know, writing for one show after another or I never thought I'd be in front of the camera. So, I mean, it was just such a, you know, so, as I said, it was an accident and, and uh, it's, it's just been such an am amazing life for me. Um, and, and when I wrote, finished the book, and I was so happy to finish this book, um, I looked back and I thought, I mean, when I looked at all those names, I thought, what a life I've had. And I said something about myself, and I was talking to Oprah, and she got tears in her eyes, and I said, we feel the same way. And I said, I wish I had taken more time to enjoy it. And I say that to you, if you're very involved in a career, you know, take a little time to enjoy the view. And that, when I finished the book, or even as I was writing it, and I went through the, the I mean, interview after interview after interview, because I never kept a diary. And I thought, did I do all that? Did that happen? Uh, I even, there's, I have a chapter on my college, because I went to an all girls school. And as I looked back, I thought, I don't know what I learned. Did I learn anything? It was a long time ago. And when I then got the records of what I had learned and what I had studied and, and the fact that it enabled me to have some confidence in myself going to an all-girls school, um, I was so impressed. I thought, wow, look what I read, look what I did. And I felt a lot of that uh, in the book. And, and this is why now I think I want to take a little time to enjoy the view. Mm -hmm. Part of the view is this. Mm -hmm. I just want to say to people sitting over here that you haven't seen my face. <laughs> <laughs> there we are, okay? <laughs> On the other hand, this is my best side. Yeah. <laughs> we are going to take questions from the audience now. We have about 20 minutes, so there are microphones on either side of the stage. If you would, please step up to a microphone if you have can a question. Can we put the lights up so I can see everybody? Can we turn the lights in the auditorium Or maybe up? turn these down. There you are. Now I can see you. Terrific. Absolutely. Thank you. And if you what would, um, give us your name and introduce yourself and ask your question. Hi. Uh, we'll go with, we'll start over here. How's that? Hi, I'm from over here. I'm Amy <laughs> on the right side. Miss Walters, I'm over, over here. Over there. Let me see. Over there to the left. On the right side. Oh, that's my left side. I'm sorry. sorry. Your left side, my <laughs> right side. Okay. I thought I was losing it. Okay. Yeah. No. The side you were looking at over here, I just want to start. My good side, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You look great. Thank you. But I wanted to ask you about Katie Couric. Yeah. In your book, you mention how she got everything when she was leaving. She had the big party, she had all the publicity, she was welcomed with open arms when she went to CBS, which was, I think, different than when you were making your first mark at being an anchor. It was more difficult for you. But she had everything going into that, and I was wondering if you had a view as to why she has not been more successful. You read in the New York Times, she's gonna be leaving. Um, I think that all of this, I think it was wonderful that, that NBC was so loving to her when she left. They were not that way when I left. They were very angry that I left. It's a different time. I'm not sure that all that publicity was good for Katie, that it, that it led to expectations that were so huge. Katie is a very fine reporter, and Katie will be fine, and she will find if she does leave, and she has said uh, that she has not confirmed that she will leave. Um, and I, I'm not certain. I think a lot of this has to be examined. Was it that she was trying to do a different kind of a news program because they were trying to attract younger viewers? Uh, the networks only care about, in terms of, of, of their ratings, uh, 18 to 49. Uh, the network news is a news that attracts older viewers. 
uh, the younger viewers m more and more are watching the internet or cable programs. I don't know whether it was that. Uh, I don't really know what the aspects were that made it so difficult for Katie. But Katie and I are friends. I've talked with her. Um, I can certainly sympathize with what she's going through. She has handled it with great dignity. Uh, and I think that she will be fine. She has to find for herself, uh, if she wants to leave, what that next step will be. Thank you. We'll take a question from the right side here. Hello, Ms. Walters. Welcome yes. to Atlanta. Thank you. And we like this side, too, of your face. <laughs> Thank you so much. Very, very impactful. Um, I'm curious in that you said that you have interviewed every president since Nixon. Um, in your dealings with the different presidents and the age of the media, how have you seen, have they become more human, more personal, and more importantly, how about the role of the first lady? Have you seen them take a more active role in the policy making, or have they always been involved in the policy? Here we're home of, you know, Rosalind Carter, which know, we love, and she was a steel magnolia. Uh, well, um, it's, it's two questions. First of all, um, you have primaries now, and you have presidential candidates that are on every two minutes. Um, I had moderated some of the debates when they first um, happened, and it was a very big deal to have a debate. There were maybe two or three in a presidential primary. And you almost never ask personal questions. I did the first interview with Richard Nixon. The first interview he did after he left office was with David Frost, for which he was paid. I did the first live interview, for which there was no payment, with Richard Nixon. It was an hour. And I worked on my questions endlessly. I did 300, then I narrowed them down, then I narrowed them to anybody. You, if you came to deliver lunch, I asked you what you thought I should have asked Richard Nixon. <laughs> and the first part of it was on foreign policy, and he, he was brilliant in that. And then I thought I will give him a chance to be a little human and to maybe get some empathy. And so I asked him how he had gotten through this period. And he said, oh, Barbara, get serious. And I said, well, I am serious, Mr. President. People are interested in, in, in some of your personal. No, they're not, he said. And I went back to my foreign policy questions. At least I tried to. I couldn't find them, and I was <laughs> sweating. Um, but I had written them, so I remembered them. And it was only when the interview was all over, when I stood up, that I realized I had taken them because I thought I was finished and sat on them. <laughs> but I tell you the story because today, so much of it is personality. What do you believe? What do you think? What's your religion? What's your relationship with your wife? What's your relationship with your mother? And so forth. It's a very different time. Um, and to some degree, that's important. And we know that character is very important. But it is, it is a, a very different than it was. Look, we can go even before that with, with people like Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You knew nothing about his personal life. You knew very little about Eisenhower's personal life. Um, and everything changed with Watergate you know, then, from then on. The First Lady, there were times when the First Lady had very little importance. Uh, President Truman's wife, she didn't, she didn't even want to be in Washington. Um, but we see more and more uh, that the First Lady, if she wants to, can play a very big role. Example, Hillary Clinton. And I'm sure that a certain, certain things will be uh, expected um, of Michelle if she becomes First Lady and of uh, Bill Clinton if he becomes first bus. <laughs> he has said that he will go to the Easter hunt bowl. <laughs> yes. yes. Hi, Ms. Walters. Uh, my name is Sarah, and um, I came down from South Carolina to come see this. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I just want to thank you for helping jumpstart my career in communications. Um, what do you tell uh, females out there now that are feeling a little bogged down with uh, getting into this field, yeah. how do you keep going? Well, first of all, you've got to get in the field. And I say get, get your foot in the door any way you can, whether it's a newspaper, magazine, your local station, that's the easiest. Network is very difficult. Get there before everybody else. Work harder. Don't whine. If somebody asks you to bring a cup of coffee, do it. Um, and just work as hard as you can. Learn as much as you can and you will make it. But the first thing is to get in there. If you can intern, intern. If not, any, any aspect of journalism uh, will help you. Just, just get your foot in the door, and that's the toughest thing. So what are you gonna do if the view wins an Emmy? 
we will be so amazed. <laughs> I mean, forgive me, because I can see you, and I think you're friends. But, but Joy has said, we're never going to win an Emmy, because with five of us, there's always one of us to piss someone off. <laughs> That's what Joy says. I think we may have a chance this year, but we never, we won once for best show. We've never won for best host. So we don't count on it. We don't think it's going to happen. Thank you. Over here to the right. Uh, yes, Ms. Wal Walters. My name is Josh. I'm a journalism professor here in Atlanta. And I wanted to kind of get your take on the broadcast journalism industry with so much criticism of it being either liberal or conservative. Who do you admire out there right well, now? Well, I think that those of us who were raised in a certain way, do not give our opinions on television. In the network news, you don't hear uh, Brian Williams' opinion, or Charlie's, or, or Katie's. And even though I'm on The View, and I'm very open on The View, nobody has any idea what my political opinions are. You now have, everybody's a reporter. With YouTube, nothing is private. And more and more of the cable programs, the idea is to just shout out an opinion rather than, um, rather than just giving the news. Uh, it's a whole new trend, and with blogs and everything, uh, it seems to be more and more opinion making. But that's a change. Um, and I think you have to uh, be level-headed yourself and, and try to resist uh, um, just listening to things where the sensation is um, just blasting out opinions. I am told that we actually have time for two more questions. so. Sorry to disappoint. We're going to take the lady here to our left, and then the next woman standing at the microphone here. What if we do four? Four. How's that? OK. OK. And I'll keep my answer short. Four. OK. okay. <laughs> we'll do one, two, three, four. All right, so we've got two on one side and two on the other. OK. okay. I'll, I'll let you guys. Yeah, sorry. Yes, thank you. We'll, no, she's not saying five. She's stopping at four. We'll, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but she's going to be in Miami tomorrow, if you guys want to. Yeah, you can just come to Miami. to Miami. She'll be down there. OK, um, the lady here. And by the way, I have signed, I thought I signed 800 books. I was told I'd signed 803. So if you would like a signed copy, I'm sure you'll find it. And I, from what I hear, and, and you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say this if I, if I hadn't heard it a great deal, but I hear it's a very good read. So I hope you'll enjoy it. <laughs> Your yes. question, please. Uh, my name is Janelle, and this is a really big moment for me. Thank you. Uh, when I was 14, I was mesmerized by your interview with Menachem Bacon and Anwar Sadat, and it kind of set me up for a fan club for a lifetime. Um, Thank you. Over the years, I've admired your talents, and I have not gone into journalism, but I've kind of followed you with your curiosity and poise, and I've tried to strive for that in my own life. My question is a little bit twofold. First of all, if you can tell me what kept your curiosity so vibrant. And second of all, since being interviewed by Barbara Walters is on my life list, can you think of any question to ask me that I can say? <laughs> oh, my dear. <laughs> Barbara Walters asked me a question. Years and years ago, I interviewed Truman Capote. And he said, even when I'm bored, I ask myself, what is it about this person that's boring me? <laughs> so I think that being curious has helped me uh, in my work. And I'm curious about people when I, when I meet them, what makes them tick, and, and how did they come at this point in their life. Um, and you either are curious or you're not. And if you, if you stop thinking about yourself, then you can be very curious about others. If you only want to hear your own voice, uh, then you don't have time to be curious. And I'm sure you're very curious. I can tell that from your question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm Anita Ruffin. I'm a retired physics professor from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Now I'm living in Sunrise Decatur at an independent living place. I have been so impressed by what you have, what you have said, and you have inspired me. And believe it or not, I feel like I'm just like you, but I'm not famous. <laughs> but you know, that's what I wanted people to understand when they read this, that so many of my experiences were experiences uh, that you've had and, and will have, and that we do share so much. When I was listening to the rundown of what was coming up, I heard that Saturday 
Sanjay Gupta was coming in to talk about how living good or living well or living better or being whatever it is, I thought I have to come back on Saturday. I mean, we all have this so much in our life that's in common. Yes. Um, hello, Barbara. Hello, Javita. My name is Deborah. And first of all, um, one thing I really wanted to mention to you was um, this. I, th I thought you had an intriguing childhood as well as adult life, but when your dad, when you saved your dad's dignity, when you told the media that he had a heart attack, that, that part I thought was really, really touching. And it, it really touched me. You've read the book. Yes, ma'am. And Thank um, you. Yes, ma'am. And then the second thing is, um, um, yeah, you hit, it on a, hit on it a little bit, but I've been watching you a long time, and I think, I honestly think you're the most uh, trusted and well-respected and uh, journalist, uh, a female journalist, and I also felt that way about Peter Jennings. And, um, but why do you suppose that, like you were talking about the rehab thing, the, oh, something like Britney Spears, the Anna, Anna Nicole Smith was on the news for weeks and weeks and weeks, mm -hmm. and why, why do you think the news media thinks that's what we want to hear? Because the magazines sell, because the really? programs sell, and because the advertisers primarily on the major programs are interested in 18 to 49. And when you're 17, 18, 19 years old, that's what you care about. And when you look at the magazines, I mean, there are half a dozen of them, and it's the same cover, and it's the same thing. We are not interested in, in heads of state. We are not interested in interviews with, with presidents. We have too many of them. I don't mean we have too many presidents, but we have yeah. <laughs> yeah. that too. We have, um, you know, it, there's, it, there's, there's nothing that's, that's individual, that's special. And, and we deplore it. And yet, I mean, if you look at most of the news magazines, what gets the rating? The celebrity who's just come out of rehab. It's not, I mean, you ask people who the prime minister of Great Britain is. A, people don't know, and B, if they knew, they don't care. It's a different time. And uh, we sort of have to go with that time. And we have YouTube. Nothing is a secret. Everything in your life is now open. So we have to learn to adjust to it, and we have to learn somehow or other to keep our own values, especially especially for our children. So this is the last question, I hope. Thank you. Good evening. It's so nice to see you. Thank My you. name is Donna Jolson. Um, I wanted to ask you, you've always um, had this uncanny, warm ability when you're interviewing um, that has led everyone you've ever interviewed to be able to be vulnerable and share things that most people wouldn't expect that would be shared. And I'm curious how this journey of writing this book and emptying yourself out and making yourself vulnerable has, um, has affected you. And I'm wondering if you're walking a little lighter having let all that go. Well, I was very happy, as I said, when I finished the book. I thought, if I read it again, I'm going to cross a lot out, because I knew that there was so much. But then I didn't know really what part of it to cross out, because I did, I thought so many people really did go through what I went through, even though my life seemed, you know, so wonderful and perfect. And since I've been in, on this book tour, going to different cities, and being able to see your faces, and to meet people, and to hear people, like this wonderful lady here, or you, um, has been um, just enormously satisfying to me, and to meet, to meet young journalists like Dravita, and, and to know that maybe a little bit of what I did helped her. We were talking about her life with three little kids, and how does she balance, and what does she do, and we have so much that we found that we shared. And I, I do want to thank you, because it is 10 minutes after 8. You could be home. You could be having your dinner, and you didn't. And you came here tonight to hear me, and I cannot tell you what satisfaction that is. It really lets me know that I've stopped auditioning, and I thank you as, as much as I possibly can for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Oh, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.